So, um, a few weeks ago, a bit more than that, uh, the uh, U.S. military assassinated via drones the Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani. And, you know, looking at the way that this was covered in Western media is really nauseating, to, to, to say the least. The extreme hypocrisy that, the, that, that you see. Imagine if someone had just randomly flown a, 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 a drone above some military, U.S. or Canadian or other Western military command and just bombed them in a third country. What would the outrage, <laughs> the level of outrage have been? But the way that this was discussed in the West was just like, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter, uh, because uh, we didn't like him and we can do whatever we want to do, basically. Now, they say that uh, Soleimani was a, uh, was, a, was a killer and that he was an imminent threat to U.S. Uh, lives, but they haven't pr pr provided any evidence that that was actually um, uh, the case. And they say that he is personally responsible for the deaths of 600 U.S. soldiers or, or U.S. Uh, military personnel. But what they really forget to say is that this happened during a time where, where uh, uh, the U.S. and its allies had occupied Iraq, uh, carried out a vicious occupation, an occupation which cost the lives of more than one million people. And that uh, Soleimani was in fact helping coordinating uh, a fight back by some layers of, uh, especially Shia militias in Iraq uh, in, that, in that period. And that really puts uh, the, the, the things in perspective in terms of who are the real terrorists in, in this uh, situation. Now the same Shia militias that Soleimani coordinated and organized were actually until very recently, even, in, even at the moment uh, uh, you know, for, to an extent, allies of the U.S. Army, the U.S. military, intervening inside Iraq and in Syria to fight against, uh, against uh, ISIS. So you see, all of this doesn't really add up. And of course, the, the, the real reason why they killed Soleimani had nothing to do with uh, right or wrong or good or bad or who is a killer and, 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 and who is not. It was pure uh, a capitalist self-interest, basically. And from Donald Trump's point of view, you know, for Donald Trump, everything is about him, uh, uh, obviously. And there were three main reasons for, to, to carry this out. On the one hand, he is facing a, an impeachment trial, which is, which is, you know, uh, which is uh, weigh, weighing down on his chances of, uh, of being reelected. And he wanted to divert the attention and kind of galvanize a nationalist hysteria, patriotic hysteria uh, behind his, his, his campaign. At the same time, he wanted to appease a layer of, of U.S. Uh, hawks, in the, uh, political hawks, and also people in the uh, military establishment, and also his allies in the region, such as Saudi Arabia and Israel, who see uh, Iran as, a, as an existential threat, basically. And he, want to, he wanted to appease them to say, yes, I am on your side, I am also working for you, because especially in the past year or so, the U.S. has been seen not to come to the aid of, uh, uh, of its allies, especially Saudi Arabia. In September, there was a, uh, Iran basically carried out a bombing of a very, very important Saudi oil installation, knocking out half of Saudi oil uh, production for, for, for a number of days. Um, and the U.S. didn't do anything against this Iranian attack on, on Saudi Arabia. Um, and so Trump wanted to appear like the strong man standing up for his allies, and also because Trump is a negotiator, and he's trying to make a deal with, 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 the, with Iran, but obviously he doesn't really have a good hand. So he was trying to appear strong. Uh, in the past year, again, the Iranians have been putting pressure on U.S. presence in the Middle East. Uh, in June, they shot down a U.S. drone, uh, uh, which, was, which was flying into Iranian airspace. Also recently, they've been putting pressure on, uh, on U.S. bases and the U.S. embassy in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq. And so um, he was trying to basically appear as, you know, to, to, to up his hand and, and to gain a, some sort of leverage in the negotiations that he, he desperately wants with, with, with Iran. So that's the real reasons why this was, this was carried out. Whether it worked or not, I'll, I'll get back to that. But then, of course, there's the Democrats who may kick up a big hue and cry. Oh, and you would think that they, these are the, you know, the, these are the crying, and these are really living to, for the plight of the, of the Middle Eastern masses. 
you have someone like Nancy Pelosi, you know, raging against Trump as if she's some kind of anti anti war uh, activist. And it's true, she voted against the, the first Iraq war, and she, I think she, she doesn't hide that. But then what she does hide is that she fully supported it from immediately after the moment after she voted against it and throughout and fought against any attempt to, to oppose and to sabotage the war effort ever since. They portray Obama as some kind of a saint as opposed to Trump, who's a, who's a war, uh, war crazed maniac. But um, look at the situation in Libya. The, the, Libyans, the Libyan civil war was started partially by the Obama administration, along with French imperialism and European imperialism, attacking uh, 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 the, what, what do you call it, uh, Gaddafi's uh, regime. And what's the situation in Libya today? It's, it's barbarism, it's pure barbarism and, uh, and decay. Or look at uh, Syria. There was a revolutionary movement in Syria, but that revolutionary movement was hijacked by Western-supported uh, uh, Western uh, 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 groups uh, supported by the US, by Saudi Arabia, by Turkey, by Jordan, and diverted into a bloody sectarian civil war. And the mess that you see in, in, in Syria, more than anyone, the barbarism that you see in, in Syria, more than anyone, is on the hands of the West. It doesn't mean that we support the Assad regime uh, at all, but in fact, if anything, the West by driving this movement, by sectarianizing it, pushing it to the right uh, into Islamic fundamentalism, strengthened Assad's hands. And that's why he, he, he is still in power, because many people in Syria say, well, uh, yeah, we don't like Assad, but these guys are going to, uh, well, they're going to kill us. The war in Yemen, which is a complete disaster, uh, with hundreds of thousands of people not having access to, 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 to any food, on the verge of starvation was started by the Obama administration. Uh, and again, also, he, he stepped up interventions in, in, in Somalia. And in fact, during the Obama presidency, the US started intervening in 70% of the, of the countries of, of, uh, of, of this planet, 138 countries, which is a 130% increase since George Bush. So, you see, the, the, the Democrats and Obama are not anti-imperialist as such. What they criticize Trump for is for being a bad imperialist, not being good enough, and not representing the interests of US uh, I I imperialism. Uh, and what they say is that by killing Qasem Soleimani, he played into the hands of the Iranian regime. And they are correct about that, I would say. They're, they're, they're right about that, because the killing of Soleimani was an act of weakness, in a, sense, in a sense. It wasn't an act of strength. And it backfired, uh, revealing exactly this weakness of US imperialism. Because uh, in retaliation, what happened? Immediately after, Iran bombed two US military bases. Uh, I don't know, I mean, you, most of you are not that, <laughs> that old, but I can't remember when that is the last time that's happened, that, that anyone bombs US military bases with um, ballistic missiles, and nothing happened. Um, and also, at, at the same time, the, the, the Iranians are putting pressure on the Iraqi state to push out US presence from the country. So all of this played into the hands of the Iranian regime and came out to the detriment of, of, uh, of US imperialism in the last uh, analysis. And this is linked to a, a larger process which has been taking place in, in the Middle East and on, in, on a world scale for in the last period, which is a deep crisis of US imperialism. Now, US imperialism, the, the, the US is still by far the most uh, mightiest military force on this planet. If you look at any, if you, you, look, you measure it by any way, it's, it, it's by far stronger than any power coming after it. But it's no longer as powerful as it used to be. And, there's a, and there's a, a, there are certain uh, reasons for that. Which means that it's not necessarily the strongest power everywhere on the planet. Uh, for instance, in, in the Middle East, when the other powers gang up on it, or in certain uh, situations, the US is not capable of forcing through its, uh, its interests as it used to uh, in the past. Part of this is because of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars which actually came out to the detriment of US imperialism. The, the, the fact is that in the US, uh, which a uh, fact that Donald Trump acknowledges, there is no appetite for war. 
There's no appetite. The, the, what he's talking about endless wars. This is what the U.S. population feels that these wars, which which is uh, which is carried out, you know, the cost of which has been uh, thrown onto the burden uh, onto the shoulders of the of the U.S. working class, who are also paying uh, paying for it with the lives of the of the sons and daughters. Uh, and no one has an interest in, 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 in continuing them because there, there's no benefits for ordinary working class uh, Americans uh, in this. At the same time, because of this, the U.S. has accumulated a huge amount of state debt. I think U.S. state debt at the moment stands at $21 trillion, if not more, um, uh, which has been compounded by the general crisis of capitalism and general crisis of U.S. capitalism the economic crisis, which has pushed all of these things into a situation where the U.S. is now in a deep, deep political social crisis. You know, the, 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 what they call the American dream, that you know, today or tomorrow would be better than today and the day after would be even better. That doesn't, that doesn't count any longer. And, and this generation, your generation in North America, are going to have a worse life living standard than, 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 than your parents. Uh, and that's just a fact. And this has, in turn, led to a deep political crisis, which means that there is an open civil war, an unprecedented civil war in Congress and in, and, and in the political class, so to say. So all of this means that the, the U.S. is incapable of intervening militarily as it used to in the past. And if you remember, only a few years ago, Barack Obama tried to pass through Congress a bombing campaign of Syria, but he couldn't. Uh, because there was too much opposition and there was too much, uh, how to say, political <laughs> risk combined with voting for, 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 for such a thing. The U.S. could not put boots on the ground. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it couldn't even uh, bomb. And meanwhile, because of the intervention of the U.S. in Iraq, because of the collapse of the US, uh, Iraqi state apparatus and the Iraqi army, the, a vacuum was opened up in the Middle East, which actually allowed Iran to gain influence in Iraq and, and beyond, the, especially the Iranian um, military uh, armed forces. Um, and, and you have a situation now on a military level that why, whereas the US is weak in terms that it cannot put serious amount of boots on the ground uh, that is deploy soldiers throughout the Middle East, Iran has hundreds of thousands of militiamen who are loyal to it in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, even in Yemen now, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Uh, and so therefore, on a military scale, the balance of forces have tipped to in, in, in Iran's favor in, in this situation. It also has a powerful uh, domestic military. The Iranian people are willing, uh, as much as they hate their own regime, they hate the Americans but much, much more and they're willing to, 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 to die in a, in a struggle against U.S. imperialism. It also developed the, you know, important, strong missile capabilities, which means that, de facto, if the Iranians, in a, in a direct clash, uh, uh, the U.S. would have to pay a very, very heavy cost uh, for engaging militarily with Iran in, in the region, something which would come out much, much worse than, uh, than, the, than the Vietnam War did uh, for, uh, for the U.S. And it would lead to social, not only a military defeat, economic uh, uh, crisis, but also important social upheavals in the U.S. itself. Uh, and we could see this because, again, as I said, when have you last seen uh, two U.S. military bases being targeted openly by ballistic missiles and there was no response. In fact, there was a response. The immediate response that uh, Donald Trump came out with, it was a, a tweet where he said, all is well. Uh, now, you wouldn't expect this from the most powerful military force that the planet has ever seen. And this shows that, that, this, the, the, that, the, that it is in a, in a, in a crisis. Um, so therefore, of course, there will not be war between uh, the U.S. And, and, and Iran. Of course, there is already another type of war. There wouldn't be conventional war, but there is already an economic war in the sense that the U.S. has imposed very, very severe, the, the most severe economic sanctions in history, in fact, on Iran. 
uh, which is something that doesn't hit the regime. I mean, it does, it does obviously affect the regime in terms of its profits and so on. But far more than that is hitting ordinary Iranians who are seeing their living standards, which were already low, uh, plummet uh, in, the, in, in this period. So, of course, these people are by no means the friends of the Iranian people, as they, as they try to say. And I think the vast majority of Iranians uh, realize this. Now, there is another process, which is that the rise of Iran uh, in the regions, the rise of Iranian influence, has had uh, certain other consequences as well. Because as you've seen, the Western, uh, Western supported forces decline and being undermined politically. Uh, and in the absence of a revolutionary political, uh, of revolutionary political parties representing the interests of the working class and, and the poor masses, you've seen that Iranian groups demagogically has been able to step into the political vacuum uh, in the region. For, for instance, in Lebanon, uh, basically since a year ago, you've had was de facto a Hezbollah uh, government. Now, for many, many years, Hezbollah has been, you know, because of its conflict with Israel and its conflict against U.S. imperialism, it's kind of been able to hide its true nature as nothing but an or, you know, Hezbollah is an ordinary capitalist uh, party. But it's been, it's been able to hide behind this conflict with the U.S. because majority of the people in the Middle East realize what uh, catastrophes the U.S. US imperialism, Western imperialism has, has uh, uh, dragged upon the region. And so Hezbollah has been able to hide behind this as long as it was, it was in opposition. But now it's been in power for, for, for a whole year. And what has it been doing in this, in this? It's been carrying out capitalist policies, the same policies that we see everywhere else in the world. That the, cap the crisis of capitalism basically means austerity, attacks on living standards, lowering, yeah, uh, lowering living standards, uh, declining um, uh, employment rates, uh, uh, decay, corruption, and so on. And the same situation has happened in, in Iraq, in a sense, that the Iranian-supported groups, uh, mainly Shia groups, have been encroaching, have, been, have more or less been taking over uh, the Iraqi state apparatus, which they control uh, completely, pushing out the U.S. in competition with the U.S. You know, the U.S. Has thought that they could install basically what amounted to a colonial uh, government there. But these Iranian groups, uh, Iranian-backed groups, have been able to, 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 to push them out, mainly, again, by hiding behind this so-called struggle against imperialism, the struggle against ISIS, which is, which is seen, and which is correctly seen, as a spawn of U.S. and Saudi uh, in, imperialism. And by that, they've been able to, to, to take power. But the problem is, again, by taking power, they've also taken responsibility for the crisis of capitalism, which in the Middle East is magnified a thousandfold. It, it shows its true self by being the most corrupt and, and uh, you know, barbaric uh, regime you could, you could possibly imagine. And the, the masses of, 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 of this region, the masses of these countries, have nothing to look forward to but unemployment, poverty, decay. Uh, at best, they're just unemployed people wandering around, but uh, often much worse than that. Um, and on the basis of this development, you've seen that, uh, that, that rising revolutionary movements no longer finding it. Before, they used to be channeled, basically, through Hezbollah, through these Shia uh, uh, militias and Shia uh, parties in, in these countries. But now, having no outlet there, they're coming out on a revolutionary basis. And that's why you see in Lebanon, you saw in, a, in sep from September onwards, it was the end of September, uh, uh, huge mobilizations, two million people, two and a half million people at its height in a country with six million inhabitants. That's, that's quite a lot of people coming out in a revolution against the whole establishment, the whole ruling class. You know, the slogan of the, of the masses in Lebanon was, all of them means all of them. That is, that no sect is, 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 is no sect, no organization, nothing is, is spared because they're all just as corrupt and all equally a part of uh, 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 robbing uh, the people. And the same in Iraq. In Iraq, you saw something, a, a big, very radical movement, which is called, they, they call themselves the October Revolution. A very, very radical movement coming out again, uh, you know, denouncing the whole of the establishment. You know, there's, there is a slogan I once saw from a video in Basra in, in the south. Uh, 
And I can't remember exactly, I mean, it's, it's a very long video, but it went something like, uh, no to the president, no to the prime minister, no to the parliament, no to the MPs, no to Shia, no to Sunni, no to uh, ISIS, no to US, no to Iran. It's against all of these people that they correct, that the masses correctly see as being a part of the ruling class, different factions of the ruling class, only conflicting each other on one point. Who is allowed to ex exploit and, and uh, suck the most blood out of the backs of, 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 the, of the masses? Um, uh, and of course, this, this put Iran in a, in a uh, strange position because until now it's been an opposition gaining on the fact that it's not been in power and acting as a, you know, demagogically trying to ride the waves of, 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 uh, of dis dissatisfaction. Uh, and it, it was interesting because the, the role of Iran and, and Soleimani himself, Hassan Soleimani, was basically traveling between Beirut, Tehran, and Baghdad, trying to coordinate the counter-revolution against this, trying to push uh, uh, the, 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 the regimes and the different people they had there to <coughs> strike down harder. In the beginning in Lebanon, um, Hariri, the, the prime minister, resigned, and also the, the prime minister of Iraq, very quickly resigned, but he flew immediately, Soleimani flew this, uh, in, into those countries and said, no, you have, to, you have to stay put and rescind your resignation, basically. In the end, they resigned anyway, because the movement was too strong. But this was the role that he was playing, and then organizing a very vicious crackdown on the masses on the streets uh, uh, as well. But it wasn't working. Every, they threw everything at these movements, but it wasn't working, because the people in these countries have just had enough. They can't stand... Uh, uh, these conditions anymore, and they don't have anything to lose. And the, the slogans of the Iraqi revolutionaries was against the U.S., against their own regime, but also against uh, Iran, which only a few years ago was, was, you know, was talked about as an as a, as a ally, as our brothers, and, and so on. Because, again, they were fighting against U.S. imperialism, they were fighting against ISIS. Um, and also, even in Iran, and I'll get back to that, inside Iran itself, you've also seen uh, a very, very uh, powerful protest movements in the past uh, three years. So the regime, and with Soleimani as the main uh, architect, basically designed a plan to overcome this, because they could see that militarily, by force, they couldn't push back uh, these, these movements, so they needed a political way out, and that was to engage in a, uh, to, to ramp up pressure on U.S. imperialism and provoke the U.S. to uh, some sort of a, a conflict, some sort of a standoff. I don't think they counted on Soleimani himself being killed, but they wanted some sort of a, a conflict to be flared up so they could uh, 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 turn away the attention of the masses against this and say, look, this is more important than, a, than the class struggle and that we need to forget about this and unite as a nation against uh, Western imperialism. And in fact, Trump, by killing Soleimani, carried out his plan to perfection. You, you couldn't have a, a more perfect execution of, the, uh, uh, of this plan. And it played into the hands of the Iranian uh, regime. It didn't weaken it. On the contrary, it strengthened it for at least temporarily. Like Soleimani was the wrong man to kill. A lot of people say, well, at least you could have, they could have killed the second in command or third in command. But Soleimani was, uh, was, was probably the only politician who was still relatively well liked in Iran because, because he did, because why? Because he didn't participate in domestic politics. Mm -hmm. He didn't really have an opinion. He, got, he was kind of aloof from all of this. He was seen as a very austere person. And because he was fighting against ISIS, he was fighting against sectarianism, he was fighting against the US. He was seen as, he had sort of a progressive aura in many people's eyes. And when he was killed, in fact, there was spontaneous mass demonstrations in Iran. People came out uh, because they, they, they saw this more than anything, not as Soleimani had been killed, but as a humiliation against Iran, another humiliation in a, in a line of many, many humiliations against uh, the, the people of the Middle East and the people of, of Iran by Western uh, imperialism. Uh, and in fact, you had a situation, uh, you know, not far from weakening the regime, you had a situation where only a few days after, the regime could organize funerals, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people coming out, uh, and basically strengthening the regime 
um, temporarily. Only a few months before that, the Iranian regime was trying to organize mass demonstrations in support of itself, and they could only get a few thousand people, maybe at most a few tens of thousands of people. But here you had a true mass movement coming up, helped by who? Not by uh, the enemies, of, uh, the, the, the friends of the people, but actually U.S. imperialism uh, itself. But then, of course, in the middle of all this, and I think this really testifies to the uh, nature of the period we are going through on a world scale, something happened that accidentally, by accident, the Iranian uh, armed forces shot down a Ukrainian passenger plane uh, which was flying, uh, flying out of... Um, an airport in, in, in Tehran. And not only did they do that, this was an accident. I think a lot of people in Iran thought, well, this is an accident, it could have happened. But they went ahead and covered this up for several days, for three or four days, in order to justify, uh, in order to keep, how to say, pushing this patriotic hysteria which was created, which they were trying to create on the back of the killing of Qasem Soleimani. And this, the, when, the, when the truth of all of this came out, this led to a, a, a massive backlash with the very, very radical protests erupting all over Iran, mainly by, by students, universities across Iran, but also other middle class elements in, 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 in particular, it was a wave of indignation. Although, you know, a, a lot of the same people who were out on the protest against the US, you know, uh, for Qasem Soleimani's uh, assassination, were uh, just a few days later out on the streets uh, uh, with slogans against the, um, the regime itself. And there were several, there were many actually resolutions coming out by student organizations from the universities saying that, yes, of course, we understand the role of the US in the region. That's been the same ever, it's, it's been a reactionary role, but that doesn't justify the oppression and the killing and the, uh, and the austerity which is imposed on the Iranian people on a, on a daily basis. Um, and the, all of the bitterness and anger and frustration has been pent up in this, in, especially in the middle class layers, uh, over the past many decades, came up with the, with the violent uh, vengeance. And um, you see, the, the Iranian regime for 40 years basically has been relying as one of its main political uh, reasons, <laughs> justifications, on the question of, of, of anti-imperialism. Uh, it's been using anti-imperialist slogan, anti-U.S. slogans, realizing that the people of Iran hate hate the U.S. so much. The U.S. have have carried out coups in Iran, has, you know, forced Iran into a war with the with, with Iraq, and so on, and, and imposed obviously the, the, the sanctions. Uh, and, and the regime has been using this to justify its own rule, to justify its austerity, its its uh, its oppression, and so on. But it's not working anymore. It's not working as it used to. And a lot of people are saying, well, you know, what's the difference? Or rather, of course, they, they wouldn't rather have the US, but they're, they're tired of the lies of the, of the regime, and they don't think that it's uh, working uh, anymore. And basically, you have a situation where the regime is in a state of total uh, crisis. Afar from his, apart from his success, minor, relative success, you can say, against US, against the US militarily in the region, uh, everything else is uh, failing for it. Economically, it's in, a, it's in a free fall. And it's unable to show any way forward in society. This is a regime which is rotten right uh, to the core. Uh, the, the society in Iran is riven with poverty and misery at all layers. You know, even people who used to be middle class before, they used to have maybe a house and a car and so on, they lost everything. People have lost their savings, their, their, you know, everything they had, basically. Uh, everything is decaying. Human relations uh, are decaying. Everyone is stressed out. Everyone is angry. Everyone is tired. People have, uh, what do you call it, uh, black marks un 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 under their eyes. There's corruption everywhere. Uh, if, you know, if you're lucky to have a job, uh, you also have to be very, very lucky to actually be paid. This is one of the countries where I think a minority of people actually get paid every month and, and a lot of people go for many months in a row, some people for years in a row, without getting, uh, uh, getting their wages. Um, a few years ago there was a massive scandal with, you know, because uh, basically the state and the regime created these enormous pyramid schemes where they set up these banks and associations which promised very high interest rates, 25%, 30%. 
And you see a lot of poor people, uh, or even middle, some middle class people, especially poor people, many of them don't have a job or their jobs don't pay much, well, seeing 25% interest rate and they put all of their savings in this, this gives them a little bit extra to, to, to make ends meet. But obviously this is unsustainable and this was just a big scam. So the only way that they could keep this going was by raising interest rates even more and attracting even more people to put their money in the bank so they could pay the interest rates. <laughs> for, for, so it was gigantic and it is still a massive pyramid scheme directly connected to the heart of the regime and a whole series of these banks have gone bankrupt with thousands and thousands of people losing everything they had. And this wasn't rich middle class people, but this was actually poor conservative layers, uh, uh, often middle class, or work, lower middle class, working class, unemployed layers, people who traditionally, in fact, have been supporting the regime. But, but, they, but, uh, but they, they've been losing everything and they've, and they've been diverging um, their paths. Uh, minimum wage has been, uh, has been uh, uh, undermined every single year, it's been growing far, far less than inflation, which is, inflation is on a yearly basis somewhere between 10 and 50 percent, but minimum wage, but, you know, maybe it raises 5, 10, 15 percent, uh, far below uh, the, the inflation rate in any case. Uh, and in November, you had a situation where because of this, uh, the enormous crisis and the deficit in the uh, state, they basically cut fuel subsidies overnight, tripling fuel, and this is a huge, it has a huge impact on people's lives because especially working class people cannot live in the cities, it's impossible to afford, to, and they live far, far outside of the cities in, in extremely bad conditions, and they pay a lot of money taking taxis basically coming into town. And now the prices are being tripled, which means that a lot of them can't even afford, there were videos of people saying, I don't have money to go to work. And this puts, again, enormous pressures. And these uh, similar austerity measures are coming to other sections as well. There's bread, uh, flour, all, uh, electricity, water, all of these subsidies are going to be taken away in the next period, while the rich and the powerful people with connections to the regime obviously live uh, comfortable lives. This very, very thin layer at the top of, the, of society are living extremely comfortable uh, lives. Uh, yes. Now, this situation has been leading to a, a series of social explosions over the past few years. First of all, you've had only, almost on a daily basis uh, s groups of, small groups of people who lost their money to these banks. You see them almost every day. I see videos of old women or middle-aged women in front of these banks yelling very, very radical slogans that you wouldn't normally think would come out of these very religious and, and, and uh, pious uh, uh, and conservative uh, layers. Um, you've had a whole series of strikes, teachers. The teachers used to be the pillar of the Islamic Republic. They were the ones who were educating the people into supporting the regime because it was the right thing to do from the point of view of, uh, of, of their, uh, their religion and so on. But uh, you know, as one of my friends once said, <laughs> Uh, Islam can make, you, uh, can make you fast one month a, a year, it can't make you fast 12 months a year. And that's how I think a lot of people in, in, in Iran feel, that this enough is enough. And in fact, all of this corruption, all of the, this decay is connected with what? Not with the, you know, not with just the capitalists, of course the capitalists, but who are the capitalists? It's the same people, it's the mullahs and the imams and the, the religious the clerical establishment who are every day out you know, in the media preaching purity and preaching you know, uh, uh, defense of the, of the oppressed and of the poor and so on. So the, the enormous hypocrisy is actually adding to the level of anger. Because people are saying you, you are not representing basically these ideas that you've been preaching and which have been the reason why people in, in their own way have been supporting the regime up until um, now. Uh, and most importantly, what we've seen is that, um, that, that, that the working class layers who have more or less been stagnant, they have not been coming out, the poor layers have not been out in any significant protest in the last 41 years in the history of the Islamic Republic, um, at least after the revolutionary fervor kind of died down, they haven't been out. Uh, but especially last November, when they cut the fuel subsidies, you saw a massive explosion of anger by working class and poor youth in particular, coming out uh, over two days, hundreds of thousands of them, 
And the only way that the regime could, uh, could uh, basically um, keep this down was by shutting out all means of communication, phones and internet and so on, or restricting it heavily, and by uh, carrying out a massive crackdown. That is, they killed, well, I don't know how many, they say 500, some people say 500, I think it's definitely more than 1,000 people. They injured five to 10,000 people and arrested just as many people. Imagine, 25,000 people basically uh, put out of action, prob prob possibly even more. 10% of everyone, that's every, for every uh, 10 persons, one of them on the streets were, were taken out basically. That's the only way they could temporarily keep this down, but they haven't solved anything. And everyone knows that this anger is just waiting for an outlet. The only reason why it didn't come out as a generalized uh, a, a revolutionary movement was because it didn't have a focal point. But what the youth really ex uh, reflect, and that's, that's always the, the, the role of the youth, is they anticipate future events and they reflect a deeper seated mood that exists within society, within these, these poor and destitute um, uh, layers. And at the same time, you had the movement that we saw uh, 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 after the killing of Soleimani, after the, sorry, after the shooting down of the Ukrainian airline, which was mainly a middle class movement. This was mainly students and middle class people who in fact, a lot of them you know, could reflect themselves in people who died on the plane because a lot of them were students, many of them uh, Canadian uh, uh, people studying or living in Canada. Um, and this is something that all middle class people in Iran are trying to do, basically get out of this barbary and this, this, this complete dead end that society is in and find kind of a, a, a way out. A lot of them had family, you know, were related or friends with friends or knew someone who was on that plane. And uh, they, could, uh, they could kind of connect and link to that uh, 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 a lot more. And they came out. And what was really interesting was the slogans that they had out. because. In 2009, there was a big movement in Iran called the Green Movement. This was also mainly a, a, a middle class based movement, at least in its beginning. And, but back then, the, the slogans were, where is my vote, uh, you know, uh, where is my voice, uh, you know, democracy, freedom of speech. And, very, and I remember there was one big demonstration in June 2009, and then Khamenei, the supreme leader, came out and said, you better, you better be careful because otherwise, and then people just didn't come out anymore. This was, this, this clearly reflected the middle class nature of the movement, which wasn't uh, revolutionary <laughs> in that sense. And they w were fighting for reforms, not for the overthrow of the, of, the, uh, of the Islamic Republic. But this time, all of the slogans were death to the Islamic Republic, death to Khamenei, even though this is very, very small, you know, as a very small group in a dictatorship standing out and saying death to this regime is a very, very uh, extremely dangerous thing. But it's as if the fear has dissipated from, uh, uh, fr from this layer. And the middle class, for the first time since 1979, basically, is moving on a revolutionary uh, direction. All the talks were about overthrowing the regime, uh, of course, there's not, it's not clear what's going to come after it for these people. But that was the, 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 the basic uh, 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 direction of this movement. And what you have is that for, for many years, for decades in fact, the Iranian regime has used, uh, has played out the middle class and the poor against each other. And they, all of the elections, they kind of put forward one uh, candidate who take up more social economic demands. And then they have other candidates who put forward more demo democratic demands, which appeal more to the middle class layers. And they kind of play these out. If, if, for example, in 2009, uh, at the height of it, the regime organized a counter demonstration with more than a million people in the 31st of December 2009, with more than a million people, mainly from, from, from the lower layers of society, working class, semi lumpen layers, the conservative layers who are out today, basically. They mobilized them, saying, look, these guys are in the pockets of imperialism and they're going to they're gonna ruin you if they come to power. And they, they basically used these layers demagogically to pacify the middle class movement and stop it from developing into a real revolutionary uh, direction. But this time, for, for the first time, you have both of the main classes, in, uh, oppressed classes in society moving in a clearly revolutionary direction. Uh, and that is, a, that is a very, very big threat for uh, the regime. This regime is a, a completely corroded 
from inside and every way you can uh, possibly imagine is completely ossified and has no real support in society, is, is riven with corruption and nepotism, old age, this is an extremely old regime, you know, because a lot of, most of the people at the top of this regime came to power in 1979, and so there is a huge generation and generational shift which is, which is taking place, and, um, and, and, and these people have completely rotten, and the next generation, their sons and daughters and so on, don't have the same kind of demagogic uh, touch that these people had when they, because they came to power on revolutionary slogans, trying to win over the masses in, in 79. Uh, or, or, uh, but um, try to lure them basically. But the sons and daughters are just pure capitalist parasites who only think about stealing as much as possible, as soon as possible, and without the, you know, kind of like Trump, without the finesse, <laughs> without, <laughs> without, without diplomacy. <laughs> uh, um, and the regime, therefore, has no uh, support left in society. It's destroying the economy. What is left of, of the industry is just being eaten up and, and destroyed, sold off by these people and their, and their um, cronies. Um, and, um, yes. And, and at the same time, this movement has pushed, has, has caused enormous divisions within the regime. You have, for instance, now in a few weeks, you have the parliamentary elections. And the hardline layers, basically, have blocked all the reformists, the liberal, they call reformists, but they're really right-wing liberals, like uh, right of Trudeau and, and these people. Um, they're basically blocking, uh, blocking them from, because they think, no, these people, the reformists, they talk about uh, democracy, they talk about freedom of speech, they never give it, obviously, but just the fact that they talk about it is dangerous enough to cause a revolutionary upsurge and we can't stop it, we need to crack down. Now, the other wing, the, the, the liberal wing of the regime is saying, no, 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 look, if you want to stop a revolution, what you must do is to give concessions, give reforms. And that's the only way you can channel it down safe paths so we don't lose power completely. Uh, you need to open up slightly because there's too much pressure. And you see, this is the predicament that every doomed regime finds itself in immediately before it's overthrown. Even the old Shah regime that was overthrown in 1979 was in this situation. All revolutions basically start from the top, uh, the, uh, f from, a po from a situation where the ruling class is incapable of, of ruling as it used to, and it's divided, with one, re with one wing saying, we need to crack down in order to stop a revolution, the other wing saying, no, no, we need to open up in order to stop a revolution. And they're both right, and they're both wrong, because when you reach the stage, there's not much more to, to, to do, and the cracks that open up in, the, in, in between these two factions will open up space for the masses to push forward. And that's a, bit, that's a general process of revolution um, everywhere. In fact, Lenin explaining the, the, the main conditions for a, 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 a revolution said, said exactly this. At the, as a first condition, you have the divisions at the top, top of the regime. Second condition is that the, the middle classes vacillate between revolution and counter-revolution. Well, in Iran, the middle classes are definitely all in favor of, of, of a revolution. And number three, you see, the, the working class is ready to go into to, to struggle. And there are very clear indications that it is becoming ready for that. And finally, what you need is a revolutionary party to, to, to channel all of this and to generalize the needs of, of, of the movements, of, of the problems of the, that the revolution uh, uh, put forth. But such, a, such an organization does not exist. And that's why, until now, this process has been uh, protracted and slowed down. If there, was a rev if there was an organization in November, this revolution, this movement would immediately acquire a national generalized form. And in fact, everyone in Iran is talking about it. There's no leadership. There's no organization. There's no program. And this program, unfortunately, it doesn't exist. And it has to be developed in the next period, in the heat of the, uh, 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 of the events. Again, when the, when the airliner was uh, shot down, the, these middle class layers were completely isolated uh, from each other, and they were isolated from the working class. They didn't know how to reach out by taking up the, the demands of the working class, the social and economic demands of the working class, and cause a united front against uh, this regime. They didn't know how, how to do that. And again, the, the, the movement died down. A similar thing happened at the, beginning of 2018, 
we also had a, had a big movement with a couple of hundred thousand people uh, coming out. But all of these were false starts because there wasn't this vehicle to channel all this rage and anger in society uh, into uh, the, the, the main focal point, which is the overthrow of, um, of this, uh, of this uh, regime. And what, what this really reflects, the, the, the general process that I tried to paint here, what this really reflects is the dead end of the capitalist system uh, uh, on, on a world scale, and of course, in particular, in the, in the Middle East. And, and, of course, and also the dead end of the capitalist class. You have a situation is where the, the only classes, the only layers who can show a way out for the region, for the masses of the region, is the masses themselves, is the working class and the poor uh, of the region. Neither, neither the domestic uh, ruling class, the, 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 the uh, tops of the regimes in Iran or anywhere else, nor the Western-based uh, ruling class is capable of developing uh, society in this, in this area which is full of potential, of natural human resources uh, 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 and so on. But the, the only allies that the Iranian people would have is, is not the Islamic Republic, it's not the regime, it's not the US or, or Western-based uh, ruling classes, but the Iraqi, the Lebanese, the Turkish, the Egyptian, all of the masses of the region which are, who are fighting in similar conditions and against similar uh, 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 obstacles. You see, the capitalism came to the fore, uh, came came to the world in Europe mainly, and it, it initially played a very very progressive role, a very revolutionary role, fighting against the obs obscurantism and of the backwardness and decay of, uh, mm -hmm. of of feudal society. It was fighting against the the Catholic Church, which was like a tumor on society in, in Europe, holding back all advances of science and culture and humanity. But in the Middle East, uh, it, it, by the time it got, it, it got to the Middle East, it already started to decay, and it played the opposite role. Today, the defenders of capitalism are what? Is, is the, the, uh, the Iranian clerical uh, regime, is ISIS, is Al-Qaeda, is the Saudi uh, royal family, is the uh, Jordanese uh, royal family, is the gangs, the warlords who, who run uh, uh, Lebanon, is the warlords who are fighting over uh, Libya, who are also all of them uh, uh, jihadis, supported by different imperialist uh, uh, factions. Uh, none of these people have any way out for ordinary, uh, the, the ordinary masses. Um, and, and they're completely um, rotten and parasitic in, in, in nature. And the only way forward, in fact, out of this misery, out of this complete dead end, is for the masses to take power into their, into their own hands. They're the only ones who have an interest in actually developing society and pushing it forward out of the barbarism of, of poverty and sectarianism and endless wars which are an inherent part of uh, the capitalist system. Thank you very much.